Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 472, featuring Phil Galler, who uh, was one of the co-founders uh, of Lex Machina. Uh, he's an expert in the world of virtual production. Uh, the Lex Machina has built many stages around the world and consulted people on stages in terms of uh, in-camera VFX stages or LED stages or LED volumes, uh, and has done many of that. In fact, they kind of started this stuff before it was LED volumes and a film that I actually worked on I'm very excited which is Oblivion and we talk a lot about Oblivion and how that was done uh, and why why sort of using that front projection system on that was so important to the show super excited to have that uh, and yeah, it was really cool. We talk a lot about in-camera VFX and uh, the entire hype train that happened during COVID around that, uh, including things like NFTs and uh, and Web3 and crypto and how all of that sort of evolved. But at the same time, there's a lot of important things that came out of that that continue to be important in filmmaking. Uh, and we sort of get into that as, as well. Uh, he's a really cool guy. Uh, he also happens to be one of the uh, one of the rare people who has actually seen Project Arena in action. Uh, and uh, so you guys might want to hear his thoughts on it because he's someone that's sort of as an expert in this area and sort of giving an idea of what he thinks about it. So very excited uh, for him to be able to tell you guys about that, his experience seeing that, uh, which is very, very cool. Uh, speaking of which, uh, if you guys want to know more about Project Arena, I know you guys have been interested in it. You can find all of this information at chaos.com. But if you want to know more about Project Arena, just go to chaos.com slash virtual production. Uh, we talk a lot about it. If you were interested in being a partner or finding out more about what we, what we can do in this area, first of all, you need to have a stage <laughs> or a place that uh, does actual virtual production. If you're just a user and interested in virtual production, uh, it's not quite exactly for you. Uh, but for, but the good news is that you do have access to uh, Vantage. So you might be able to look at Vantage. Vantage is our real-time ray tracer, which is the foundation of what Project Arena is. So you'll be able to know at least a little bit about the real-time interactions inside of Vantage. So go check it out. Um, speaking of that, uh, Project uh, Vantage has a new update, which I'm sure you guys should be aware of. Uh, Vantage 2 Update 3 is out. It includes many new updates, including uh, support for layered materials. Uh, Multi-mats uh, have been added to the render elements, and there's been several UX changes that are definitely really good to have as well. So uh, just make sure and check that out. Again, all of this can be found at chaos.com. Uh, I want to let you guys know about an event that's happening. Uh, this can be found at chaos.com slash events. Uh, this is another Chaos Unboxed event that's happening on May 9th. I'm super excited. It's actually happening in London and Madrid on the same day. Uh, also, one of the things that's important about that is Nikos will be doing one of his creative lighting classes. Uh, I believe it's in the London office. Uh, so definitely go check that out. Uh, again, all of this can be found and you can register over at chaos.com slash events. Now, if you guys want to know more about the podcast, you guys know what to do. Our podcast page is chaos.com slash CG Garage. Uh, again, chaos.com slash CG Garage. If you'd like to follow us on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash CG Garage Podcast. You can always go and watch these podcasts, which is also fun to do, uh, which is where we put all of our videos, including the podcast, and that is at youtube.com slash chaos group TV. If you'd like to uh, adv uh, give us some uh, advice or some suggestions of people on the podcast, we've been getting a lot of them and we do respond to many of those great suggestions uh, just email us labs at chaos.com again that is labs at chaos.com but for now please enjoy episode number 472 with phil galler welcome to another cg garage where the chaos group talks you'll know it's over when the last bucket drops we're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range, we know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. Okay, Phil, thanks so much for doing this. It's been uh, it's been a, a, a little bit. We've talked here and there about different things in virtual production. And obviously, this is an area that I've been focusing on a lot, as a lot of people know. And so I'm sure I will have lots of questions from an expert like yourself about this. 
Uh, but uh, uh, let's let's start with a little bit of background. Where where obviously did you come from visual effects? Did you come from filmmaking? What got you interested in 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 the the world of computer graphics and what we do today? Yeah, um, and thanks for having me. So uh, my um, my background actually started. Um, uh, I was uh, very very young. Um, my sister is a ballerina, and so I have been in theaters doing theater lighting. Um, and so I started as a theatrical lighting designer, um, then moved into TV and then film. Um, uh, I think I was in theaters at the age of six or seven, something like that. Wow. So um, I worked in theater professionally in Boston, uh, went to college in Boston for theater, and then in college, trans just transitioned into film and television. Um, and that was my, my sort of nexus point. Um, but I was always fascinated by computer graphics, even in my theatrical days, um, you know, I, I used to play with Cinema 4D and um, even other uh, uh, tools prior to that um, uh, as sort of a uh, just like a, a hobby. Um, and uh, my dad's an electrical engineer. And so there were always computers around the house and, and all sorts of gadgets. And so I was always building or tinkering or playing with something. And um, and uh, and uh, mother was a, a VP at Kodak and uh, uh, helped sell a business to Kodak many years ago. And so I am um, sort of like a combination of the two of them. Gadget, gadgetry and electronics and a little bit of business um, with an air towards uh, theater and, and entertainment. So I am... Um, yeah, uh, background led me eventually to starting Lux after working at a local production company as a, a, a vendor um, and a sort of production coordinator in LA for many years. Okay, so how how did that happen? Like, how did you sort of think about what Lux was and how to how to do that? Because what I mean, there was obviously a transition to you saying it's like, oh wait, this is this involves a whole different part of lighting <laughs> yeah it's interesting right so um right around the time that i was starting my work um in live tv sort of professionally in los angeles uh there were uh, a new range of what i would call sort of like products um that were on the market intended to deliver um graphics to screens uh, media servers right so media servers had become more prevalent they were starting to get significant use on broadcast shows, um, as well as um, uh, theatrical performances. And they weren't in the film industry yet, um, but it was clear there was an opportunity to bring them into the film industry, right? Like it, it seemed like, very, you know, put a LED screen or projection screen out a car window and play plates back on. It was a renaissance-ish of what happened in the 50s and 60s, right? Like it's actually not that much of a stretch from what had, had already been established um, in many movies in the past. And um, I think we looked at it and said, well, um, why not come up with a solution that allows us to use the tools that are being used in film and TV uh, on the live side or TV specific on the live side and bring them into the film world. And um, my lighting knowledge sort of transformed into video knowledge very quickly because there's such a crossover in, um, you know, using an LED wall to light someone. What does the light look like? How does the light work? You know, you still have key and fill ratios you have to deal with. You still have backlight you got to deal with. You still have separation. And then you look at green screen applications that were the existing solutions and they have the similar problems, right? Like, how do you separate the talent from the background? How do you make the green uh, look the proper exposure so that you can pull a clean key? All those kind of things. And um, everything sort of gelled for me, I think, in 2011, 2012, when we were on Oblivion. Um, oh, right. I was on that. Really <laughs> Yeah, right. I think exactly. Right. We all. I think a lot of us actually crossed paths yep. there for the first time. Right. Was this um, this place where we felt certainly on set that um, you know Claudio Miranda had wanted to push the boundaries, and so we designed this big projection solution and um, put a bunch of media servers that weren't really meant for doing the work that needed to happen in the film space. Right. Um, and it was clear there was room for someone to come in and go, okay, let's help push products in a certain direction and, and then um, eventually move everything to real time. Um, and so that was the inception of Lux. And actually the core idea was that one of us could do one job at a time. Two of us could probably do three, three of us could probably do five, right. five of us could probably do a dozen jobs at a time. And so we started building the business organically around project based work. I think it was super interesting because I remember very specifically in the early days of Oblivion, you know, they were we needed to prove to the studio that doing that set as a green screen was the wrong choice. 
And yeah. so we actually had to off, we had the set digitally. So they're like, oh, you already have the set digitally. So because it was so shiny and so much glass, yep. and so we <laughs> actually so put water. a giant virtual green screen there and just did a render and just showed how horrible <laughs> that shiny yeah. reflection of green everywhere would be and how impossible yep. it would would be. So incentivized the studio to not do CG or not yeah. do VFX, uh, not weird. do it in post, right? Like, it was the worst case scenario, right, for a green solution, right? It was Chrome and highly reflective services with a, a pool in the middle of the living room, basically, <laughs> right? It, like, it was like the worst case, right. you know? And, and I think in, in turn, it became the best use case for um, getting real reflections and some real lighting in there. Um, and of course, LED didn't exist the way it did You did now, projection, so right? Projection, And it was yeah. front projection um, or? Front projection, okay. yeah, yeah. And that worked really well. And it well. was pretty um, big. Like, how big were those? Yeah. yeah. Um, a little over 400 feet and it was 40 feet tall so it was 21 projectors 11 servers yeah it's a lot of stuff um and syncing and, that and all think, together I, right yeah syncing it all together trying to sync it all together learning what that really meant for the first time at that scale and even at that scale like there weren't that many shows on the planet that were using that much equipment right like and so there, it's not even like you could go oh let's go talk to the disney folks they've got a couple of shows sure. that use this right but you know, almost 15 years ago now that when we're going to do the R&D or whatever, 12, 13 mm -hmm. years ago, there weren't that many shows that used that type of tech and deployed it temporarily. Right. So it was, um, yeah, it was a really exciting time. Um, um, but yeah, that, that led to the creation of, of Lux. Yeah. Um, That's actually, actually amazing. I didn't, I, I, I always like forget about that origin story because it's so cool. And I remember, you know, like, uh, I think the Pixel guys were the ones who shot all the footage that was up in, in Hawaii, yep. right? They went to the, t yeah. to the top, um, mountain in the, on the big Island and just saw, shot these 360 videos, yeah. uh, of sunsets and yeah i think they use six reds yeah yeah like they just yeah. yeah it was like it was like a big stitch one, one and of those, uh, those i remember stitch. what because i'd i'd worked on uh, uh uh some stuff with uh with with tom cruise uh to do some digi double stuff with him and I, and he was talking about that set and he said how awesome that set was because he said i felt like i was there like i would just it yeah. just was a much better experience for him as an artist or as a, as a, as an actor to, to yep. be inspired by what he was seeing out the windows. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, so it, it's really interesting. There's so much convergence here too. Like you're talking about the digit double work, right. And I think there was a bunch of head replacement, yes. right. Um, and so uh, look, we didn't have a lot of camera tracking back then, but one of the things that we ended up doing is actually putting a green square behind his head. You know, we looked at the camera, place a green square kind of where his head right. is and actually manually tracked it as he walked. <laughs> Which then is what allowed the digital double head work to right. get, I think, done in, a, in, a, in an easier fashion. And it was sort of the beginning of some of this evolution that we see of frustum tracking yep. and then, uh, you know, projecting green just behind a person so you can replace them and stuff yeah. like that. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a really interesting show that I think for us was groundwork for what was clearly going to be something in the future that we needed to build towards. Yeah, yeah. So that's 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 cool. I mean, and and like you said, this we're not necessarily it wasn't really reinventing the wheel it was just doing it in a in a, in a new way right rear projection has yeah. been around since hitchcock right <laughs> or, or longer yeah, exactly. right? yeah and so so we've 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 done that but but what what was obviously you know you, you mentioned you were doing front projection and that was huge and yeah. so when you do that big you don't worry about parallax that much you just have to have something out the window right yeah exactly uh yeah. what what were like when was the things like ah led technology is going to allow for this much more rather than using projectors. What was the thing there? Yeah. Tomorrowland. Um, I think there were a couple of shows between, like we started house of cards, I think oh, between right. oblivion and Tomorrowland yeah. and house of cards, of course, was a, you know, it was a different type of scope, right? Like it's all vehicles. It's all small. It's still going to be green screen, but we're going to use led um, to create those reflections and the interactive lighting to make it feel more believable, right? And I think House of Cards for us was one of these turning points where we go, okay, yeah, like obviously this is going to become something and technology always does one thing, that things get higher resolution, right? No matter what we do, things get higher sure. resolution. So the LED walls will eventually get higher resolution and then that evolved into Tomorrowland where we had some of the very first, I think, uh, fanless LED, right? Um, which meant we could use it on sex. One of the original problems that the LED was actually very loud because it needed to be, the, the, you know, everyone thinks LED is energy efficient. It is, but like you put a, a hundred million of them together and next to each other, they're not so energy efficient anymore and they're not so cool. Yeah. 
right? So you've got to cool them so there's a lot of fans around. Um, and so it, Tomorrowland was was a clear turning point, was used entirely LED of a variety of different types um, to do the work that we did there. And um, that worked really well. Um, and it was Lux's sort of first job. Um, um, but it was really, yeah, it was really interesting. It was a great opportunity to uh, actually start to work in 3D in a weird way. Um, not necessarily in the content side, but on the deployment of the content. We projected the content onto surfaces and were able to rotate it in 3D for when the cameras needed to move. Things that we just couldn't do on Oblivion in mm -hmm. real time. And so how were you doing that in real time then? Were you using game engines at that point? So, no, not game engines. What we actually ended up doing was chaining two media server products together. Because, okay. um, you know, uh, I think it was such a new industry that no one really wanted to make lots of changes for what this, you know, sure. nobody knew it was going to be. And so there was no one product that made it work. And, and the way Claudio, who was also the DP on uh, Tomorrowland, liked to work was in a, in a being able to jump around very quickly type fashion. And, and um, but it was in a, in a, in a weird way, in a linear, um, a linear story piece right um uh was this moment where um they're trying to navigate the um uh prophecies of the future basically and um so we've got to go through time and then all these things happen in linear fashion and so it's almost like building an nle inside a system that really wants a linear editing platform um and then taking one server that outputs 2d textures outputting those 2d textures into another server that's able to map them in 3d okay. and then using a very almost like a WYSIWYG type interface to navigate the okay can we rotate this thing okay now we're going to do cylindrical projection which means that as we move these pieces of the set up and down the content will effectively be sticky and it'll stay in place of where that wall is so we'll be able to see new content exposed as parts of the so walls it's much more two and a half d in a sense yeah it was exactly it was a, it was a two and a half d approach gotcha. exactly um, and it worked really well. Um, and, you know, the show was, was decent. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, a, it's a really good show. I did a beautiful, it's a beautiful show. So, yeah. Uh, and that's a thing that I think is interesting. I mean, you were automatically, you, your, your two big shows that you just mentioned, you know, obviously Oblivion and, and uh, uh, Tomorrowland, those are Claudio shows, right? And so you have the direction yeah. of uh, you know, Oscar winning <laughs> the effect, uh, DP on that. How, I mean, that is an important distinction, right? That you don't, most people in visual effects don't have the luxury of having that direct an input yeah. and workflow from a DP like that. Yeah, it was uh, it was amazing, right? Like it's it's always a double edged sword, right? Like uh, when you're that close to a stakeholder, they have very specific opinions about what they want, um, and um, that means you have to meet that need, right? Um, and I think in many cases, it's difficult to do that with new technology and new workflows. And so we were inventing a lot on the fly. Um, we were building a lot of tools out. We were building a lot of workflows out. Uh, we were doing a lot of testing. Um, we started testing with real time content actually on Oblivion, um, or sorry, on Tomorrowland. Um, and that we were using some generative art, um, not AI generative, but like more like procedural art mm -hmm. um, uh, to create effects and stuff like that. And um, um, Claudia was really into that. Right? He's really into technology and understanding how it works. Um, and that was a huge benefit to us. Um, from a direction point of view, he was able to have a conversation about what he wanted it to look like and how the light should work and, and, and what the colors needed to be and what his expect expectations were. Um, but of course, you know, got to meet the need, right. right? So you've got to be able to build and do it quickly enough to meet the expectation that's set for you. What, so, so, so yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. So how, how did it evolve from there? How did you sort of start to, to, you know, see the, the evolution of virtual production from what you guys had done to, to where it's going today? Yeah. Um, I think in a, in a nutshell, it was clear that the LED was going to get tighter pitch and was going to be able to be used behind the background. Yeah. Like what was the pitch on, 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 on yeah. Tomorrowland? That was an 11 millimeter was the best. Whoa, we could. That was the that's highest huge. resolution. <laughs> yeah, that's really big. Right? Uh, that was the highest resolution uh, fanless technology that was available at the time that we could use. Just for set. perspective, like now a, a good pitch is 1.8 and this is 11. So the, yeah, the distance yeah, between yeah, pixels is 10 here. times. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I mean, in, in, you know, in, in 10 years, we've got an order of magnitude, right? right? So it's significant. Um, so uh, we, um, uh, post Tomorrowland, um, uh, 
you know, I think at the time there was like a Tomorrowland every other year, you know, in terms of scope of the sure. business. And with the rest of the, what we did as a business was uh, continue to do lots of live TV, lots of corporate that use the same technologies, right? And it gave us an opportunity to, to push the tech forward and to continue having the conversations about what we needed. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that led to a conversation with Lucasfilm um, around doing a bunch of R&D um, for, I think it was X Labs at the time, um, yep. uh, around uh, what turned into Rogue One and then eventually into Solo and then Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. Um, and that uh, was probably started in 2015. It went on for, I don't know, whatever years. Um, but that R&D led to the relationship of understanding, okay, what where are they headed? Um, and it was clear that very early on to us, um, uh, through another tangent, uh, very sure the same person at Lucasfilm then ended up at Epic Games, um, that that these things were all going to coincide. Um, and in the middle, we were looking at the rest of the industry going, well, we're seeing Touch Designer. We're very familiar with Touch Designer. We've used it on a bunch of projects. Mm-hmm. We've done a bunch of real-time work with it. We've done some tracking with it. Um, we've got Notch on another side, and we know not how Notch works, and it's very similar, but it's more geared towards truly real-time you know, uh, 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 content creation. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was clear that while both these things were great, neither of them was a game engine, right? It wasn't as accessible, and they weren't as extensible in the same way. Touch Designer... Yes, to some extent, but you're also having to build out your own simulation physics and you have to build out you have to build out a lot of stuff that's really complicated, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as well as at some level early on in Touch Designer Days, your own rendering concepts, right? Like what what does the environment look like? What is there was no PBR at the time and you sure. know, and you get into game engines and there's a language that everyone can kind of mm-hmm. use. Um, so I would say around 2015, 2016, we actually started going pretty heavily into um, more procedural use of real-time effects on set. So in Solo, we used uh, Notch in to create real-time effects on mm-hmm. set. Um, but it was clear that that gave everyone the thing that they really craved, which was, hey, we're telling a story. The story is going to change a little bit, and we want to be able to change this thing so that we can better represent the change in the story. And the thing could be the explosion's got to be bigger. The laser fire's got to be a different color. Um, now there's none of those things, and they're going to be in an ice tunnel. And or, oh, by the way, uh, we actually want sparks coming out of these speeders, but we forgot about them because the speeder's doing something different than it was doing yesterday. And how do we do all that now, right? We're not waiting for for visual effects to render out content, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that was sort of the genesis of, I think, where we ended up and how we ended up on, on The Mandalorian, ultimately. So you guys did end up on the Mandalorian. Like that was a, there were some things that were going on there. They're like, okay, this is what's going to happen here, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it was very clear at the end of Solo. Uh, certainly clear for us at the end of Solo. Like right away, we were involved in conversations of. Uh, I mean, there wasn't a concept of a volume LED volume at the time. Right. So it was what what would this look like? We had built a cylindrical c- screen for uh, for Solo. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had built cylindrical scene, you know, screens for years. And so it became clear that we could design a cylindrical type surface. And the goal was, and, and, and um, probably my uh, giving my toes, well, probably not doing just running down the rabbit hole of IBL work. Mm-hmm. Right. And like the ultimately the goal was create an environment that was as close to what image based lighting might enable in uh, both i guess at some level the sun and the environment in the real world but also in visual effects sure. right like what does it look like right um how, what is what does that actually mean when you're putting an hdri on, on an environment and that is i think the core concept of you know first we wanted it to be a spherical environment um physical environment but like we couldn't make spherical led at the time that was cost effective right. still can't um you know uh, as evidenced by our friends in right. vegas who have that giant sphere <laughs> um very expensive um and so a cylinder with the top is is relatively close, right? right? Um, and that's how we started designing, yeah, the LED volume for for Mando. And so you, I mean, you guys have always been, you, you know, not necessarily a stage, but a place that sort of helps design stages and helps configure yeah. things, right? Yeah, Lux was at its core um, trying to be as close to production as possible and solving the problems of production. Okay. Um, we have, there is a stage at Lux now, but the goal was never to have a stage. The goal was to help other people actually build out the solutions they needed to tell their stories. Right. It's a, it's problem solving. Right. Uh, it was always about problem solving and it was always about problem solving for storytellers, um, because we believe that they were the ones who, 
um, had these visions that like they were going places and other vendors were going, oh, we can't do that or oh, that's going to be this or it's going to be that. And like, how can we think outside of the box to solve this right. problem? Right. And so, and so a lot of stages, like especially, you know, the big high quality stages, you can see it's like, you know, built by Lux, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Lux built, uh, I don't know, hundred, hundreds of stages. You guys built hundreds, hundreds of stages. Of stages yeah. Which is yeah. awesome. Yeah. I would say both temporary and permanent. Over the and that's actually an interesting distinction. You just the temporary stages, right? So there are a lot of stages that are like built on the fly for a specific purpose, right? Yeah. Yeah. We build, I would say Lux was, was at the peak of, of all this was, and maybe even still is building a, a couple every other month, a couple of months. Wow. Maybe. Um, it's a lot. It's a significant, it's a significant. So yeah, you'll have like a sequence with a train. It's like, okay, we want a specific yeah. design stage. It's the shape of the train or whatever. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we were doing it. I mean, even through COVID uh, on the train topic was bullet train, right. Yep. It was, which was a mid COVID show. And, um, I actually, I designed bullet, the bullet train setup and, um, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was one of like three or four projects we did during COVID, yeah. right? Around that, the same concept of how could we use virtual production inside a, a stage to avoid people having to go places. Let's so. talk a little bit about that t subject of COVID, right? Because this yeah. is really when the, everyone was like, oh, this is going to solve all of our problems. Do you think that actually helped virtual production or did it a disservice of misinformation? <laughs> because I've seen yeah, a little bit of both. It's a really good question, right? So we had actually, um, you know, you sit down, you know, roadmap out your business. And in 2019, pre-COVID, we had roadmapped out, okay, by 2023, virtual production will really be established. There won't be that many people in the space because, you know, we've got this 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 edge where we're close to Epic. We've got a, a good relationship with the parties in the space. No one's really looking at it. There's no reason to look at it right now. We can kill, keep building it organically. And by the time we get to 2023, four or five years from now, we'll have... We'll have the best and nicest boat uh, related to virtual production. That'll be great for the business. Mm -hmm. um, and then enter COVID, right? <laughs> Where like all of a sudden uh, that was like, well, well it's got to be 2023. It's got to be ready in March of 2020. What are you talking about? Right. Right? And um, <laughs> um, uh, I think so in some ways, I think it was it was great. Right. In some ways, uh, look, we were able to sell our business during that time because of the work that we were doing. And that was a phenomenal opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right. But on the second hand, um, uh, when you force technology to mature very quickly, oftentimes um, it does so in a fragmented and disorganized and very chaotic way. And I do I think that's where we are, um, right? I think a lot of people had no choice but to pivot into virtual production because it was a way of doing work. And I don't obviously begrudge anybody sure. that. Um, uh, but I think that it happened very quickly and in such a way that um, you have so many different flavors of virtual production now. And I think for us, it wasn't even virtual production. Like we just view what we call the ICV mm -hmm. effects and camera visual effects. Just a, a it's just production, sure. right? It's just another tool for production. For us, virtual production is this big over encompassing thing that involves motion capture and animation yep. and camera tracking and simulcam and all this stuff. Right. Um, and for us, this was just an extension of that environment. Um, um, but I, I do, I think, you know, was there a lot of misinformation? Yeah, totally. Right. And were there some really, really big players, I think bigger than we've ever seen in the visual effects space that all of a sudden had a vested interest in some of this tech. We look at Unreal, we look at Unity, we look at really massive businesses that have money that like most visual effects companies can't even fathom ever sure. having ever in their, their entire existences. Um, and I think that makes it really difficult to have for a, an industry that is about storytelling and about individual storytellers trying to come together, I think it makes it very difficult to maintain a narrative when there's a lot of marketing that goes into, into something. Right. Um, and not that I think the marketing was bad or wrong in many cases. I think it just, it makes it difficult for the storyteller to cut through the noise and understand how to leverage the tools the best. And I think that was when I think about the, the downsides of COVID, it was, you know, a, a, a creative going online and Googling, I need virtual production and getting everything from, you know, uh, uh, people who've done it for decades, right. To people who are saying they've done it for decades, but have just started and are outsourcing all the work sure. and don't know how to do it. And there's no way to tell it apart because there's no established industry. Sure. So, well, I, I've got a theory, which I'd like for you, I'd love for you to either poke holes in or tell me what's going on. But so, so this was, you know, this was happening, like you said, 2019, 2020, 
and everyone was looking at this. And then all these big tech players were involved, right? Like I, like like Epic and uh, and everyone, right? And yeah. at the same time that everyone was excited about virtual production, people were also excited about something called the metaverse and Web3 and all this other weird stuff that they were involved with. And everyone was dumping money like crazy into these things, right? And the promise of Web3 is going to save Hollywood or whatever else was going on. And that means metaverse and that means profit. Like, I don't know what was going on, right? It was a little yeah. bit like the, the underwear gnomes in, in South Park, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? So it's like, okay. So so that was interesting, but everyone seemed to have forgotten, just as you said, that, wait, this is about storytelling, right? <laughs> and And so I think what was going on with all these big tech companies is like they saw virtual productions as a means of getting things into the metaverse. Yeah. And I think that's what motivated them. Do you believe that, that is true? <laughs> so I, I definitely believe part of the industry uh, a, still feels that way. And and what definitely was that way, right? I think there was a, a big push into virtual, right? right? And by virtual, I mean virtual, virtual experiences, virtual, mm -hmm. vir, you know, and, and uh, virtual opportunities for people at home who were sitting at home on the couch during COVID to explore worlds that they hadn't explored sure. before, right? Um, now, I don't think anyone ever defined the metaverse properly. Like nope. I, you know, I, I I've seen uh, was it World of Warcraft is effectively a metaverse, right? Like sure. it's a place a bunch of people go. They, you know, um, and it's like okay, well, where does the, where is the line of what is a, a metaverse and, and what is a video game, sure. right? Um, but yeah, I do. I, I think that's I think that's correct. I think um, metaverse and Web three, right? And we saw it with NFTs and we saw it with you know cryptocurrencies to some extent. Um, became the hype words, the investment hype words, right? And I think in many ways, virtual production became that, right? And it became lumped in with the metaverse. It's a virtual technology, um, virtual op solution. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I would agree. I think a lot of people, uh, I, I think honestly got burned. Like I think a lot of people invested a lot of money and probably haven't seen their return necessarily, right? Um, uh, but do you but think I, that virtual yeah. production kind of got lumped into that? buzzword 100, thing 100 percent. yeah there's a chart for this which i don't remember the name of you know it shows the uh the rapid increase of a new technology yeah. and then the trough of right, right, right. which yeah. is where people start to realize the i think it's the gartner hype cycle yeah, yep, right yep. um yeah where people start to realize that like oh man we were really excited about something that probably wasn't real or wasn't mature right. enough yet right um and then you start this really long path of turning this industry into like the thing that it could become right. um and uh, I think COVID was the like absolute pinnacle of the top of sure. that hype cycle of, you know, first it was what can people believe in right now to make them feel better about what's going on in the world, right? And one of the things is everything's going to be virtual. Everything's going to be as good as it is in the real world, in the virtual world, sure. right? Um, which gets us into Web3, it gets us into Metaverse, it gets us into crypto, it gets us into NFTs. Um, and then, of course, coming out of COVID, it's like, no, we actually want to spend time together because that's what humans do, right? right? We spend time together and telling stories to each yep. other. Um, oh, and by the way, none of this tech was as mature as we thought it was, and maybe there isn't a great business model here right now. Um, so, like, what are we going right. to do? Um, but I agree. I think, um, you know, and in some ways, it's just like a cycle that will always continue, right? Like we've seen this over the years and we're seeing it right now with AI, mm -hmm. right? The amount of investment in AI and two years from now, do I think there will be some AI products and tools on the market? Of course. Yep. Um, but do I think most of them are not the ones that we're seeing today or evolutions of what we're seeing today? Probably not, right? It's going to be more tangible than that. And it's not going to be you know, and eventually it may change the way we all work and we should deal with that, of course. Right. Um, but it's just part of the cycle. Yeah. I just think that, you know, it's, if you really just think of what you were doing, you know, like just look at the oblivion thing, right? It's so simple yeah. and just so perfect, right? Like why turn this into a metaverse thing when it really yeah. is about really good visual effect or in-camera yeah. experiences and being able to tell a story? Yeah, make something look good. And, you know, one of the metrics I've always used um, to sort of guide my career is so I walk up to a monitor and I believe what I'm yes. seeing, right? Like, then I feel like 
it's the going in the right direction. Whether it's I believe the story or I believe the emotion or I believe the lighting, it doesn't matter. If I walk up and I go, yeah, this feels real, um, I know that I'm being touched and it's genuine. And I think like always looking through that lens has sort of always helped guide my career, right? right? Um, and and I think that we, lo- we lose sight of that at times, right? We go, we get really excited about technology and instead of letting technology help creatives, we try to shoehorn it into what they're doing. Go, now you're going to use this because this is going to get us in- into this metaverse thing and solve this problem. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Absolutely. Well, besides that sort of, uh, 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 you know, some of the hype cycles, there, there were still some very interesting evolutions in virtual production that happened between 2019 and uh, 2024, right? So what yeah. were some of the big ones that you noticed along the way that were, were going on? Yeah. Um, I think one that's really, uh, for me, is still really cool is the use of multicam, uh, multicam in camera visual effects work. And as I think that allowed us to do something that we weren't able to do prior, which was uh, twofold. One was um, for filmmakers who wanted to use multiple cameras at a time. How do we deal with this problem of latency and synchronicity, but also of how do we show off all, you know, multiple frost that might be overlapping. But more importantly, I think it opened up a new market, um, which I think broadened the appeal of virtual production, right? So it opens up live television, Mm -hmm. um, which is always a multi-cam environment to virtual production. Um, I think we saw the advent and significant increase of augmented reality on television. Um, I think that's a huge part of what virtual production is and something that, you know, I, yeah, we use the word simulcam on the film side, but it's the same, right? It's this idea of creating an overlay graphic or keying something out, right? Um, uh, we saw that be heavily incorporated into esports events. Um, and the esports market itself, a lot of hype around it, but it was indicative of what could be achieved in a live television market. And now we see that, I mean, uh, adopted in, uh, and actually in really, really mundane places. And I think it's when things become mundane, it's when we know that we've been successful in, in moving the the conversation forward. Right. And my mundane example is always the Weather Channel. Right? Like the Weather Channel. Oh, that example is so great. Hard. Yeah. The flooding yeah, stuff, right? Like think, yeah, right. And like when something like that, like not only is it accessible, right? They're not a high budget outfit, right? We're not talking about, right? Like a, they don't have a hundred million dollars to spend on tech and art, right? They managed to, to piecemeal stuff together. They've got a great use case for it. It looks awesome. Um, it adds to the storytelling. Um, it invokes emotion. I Like it's great, right? And it's super mundane, <laughs> right? And I think as soon as we're doing that, we have been successful in, in, in moving these things forward. And to me, over the last three years and four years, seeing them, them evolve has been a key indicator to me that we're on the right track. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a really great example. I thought that was, I, and I think uh, Ben Grossman was the one who shared that link with me. And I was like, that is perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's great work. Right. And we're seeing it now elsewhere. Right. right? We see it in uh, some of the NASCAR stuff. We see it in, I think, Formula E. Mm-hmm. Um, we're seeing it in, like I said, the esports competitions um, where we've got both use of LED and AR, and I think uh, it's great. Yeah. I think it's really great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, that's 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 cool, uh, and I'm excited you're able uh, to do that. Um, so, so there's, I mean, you've one of the, we've been trying to do this podcast for a little bit, and I think you're like, well, I gotta, I want the timing to work out well. So, so tell us a little bit about where you are now yourself and what's going on. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And I, I, um, I, um, you know, when we sold the business, many, many, well, now it's only going on three years almost. Um, it was clear that there was a big bright future and a big north star to follow mm-hmm. um, around the idea of. Um, not the metaverse necessarily, um, because I don't believe that's been a defined thing with the transmedia uh, future, which I can definitely define, which is the, I think, artists needing to be able to create content that moves seamlessly between uh, high quality visual effects, gaming platforms, headsets, and phones. And I think if, um, uh, if there's anything I've learned over the last four years, that is definitely coming. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, um, I see, I see it in, in almost every major streamers, the glint in the eye over okay, how can we get games involved in what we're doing here in the game? But hasn't that conversation been going on for like thirty years? <laughs> so for for an incredibly long time. But I think we're at we're at this moment, right? And like in a weird way, I think we're at this moment of yes, it's been going on for thirty years, and it hasn't successfully happened right. yet, right? But I can I can sit here certainly today, and I can look at things like Fallout, The Last of Us, sure, um, uh, uh, significant gaming 
uh, crossovers in from games to film and TV, and then in some cases as back a story, again, right? but not as an asset. <laughs> Not as an asset, not as an asset, exactly. Um, and, but and, and I think to some extent, part of the challenge is that for 30 years, large visual effects companies have been talking about doing this. And the problem with large visual effects companies is that they tend to have a lot of infrastructure and they need to leverage their infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I'm looking at, uh, I mean, just to, I think to put a number to it, right? I'm looking at what probably 200 million players between Fortnite, Roblox, and Minecraft, all who are effectively telling their own stories and are digital creators that are inviting people into their islands and are starting to actually do the thing that we talked about, right? Which is to be indi individual creators making these awesome stories. Um, and if in five to 10 years, they all become professional uh, digital creators, um, well, we've got a lot of problems because um, that's way too many. But even if 1% of them become digital creators, there's going to be an order of magnitude more digital creators on the planet than there were five years ago, right? Um, and those people are going to want tools, I think, that are similar to what they're using right now, right? They have been brought up on games and game engines and platforms that enable them to create content in real time. And so I, uh, at, as part of what we were hoping to do at Lux was... Um, create a renaissance of tools for people to do this work. Mm -hmm. And um, I recently have stepped away from my leadership role at Lux to go start a new business mm -hmm. um, that's built around the idea that we can, we can achieve this, that we can start to build tools for people who want to work in real time and eventually want to work cross-platform. Um, I think it is the future, and I think the future is also... 10 people doing the work of 100. Not because the jobs are going away, but because there's going to be so many more stories to tell. There's so many more devices to target. There's so many more uh, screens, headsets, you know, 10 years down the road, it's implants and all sorts of weird stuff. It's very dystopian, but like at some level probably comes, right? Like, I mean, I would love to have a pair of augmented reality glasses that when I walked down the street, it showed me sure. the, the driving directions or the walking directions I was having, right? Um, and, and I think we have to be prepared to figure out how to create tools that enable people to solve problems that um, we solve problems that are related to where their stories are going to be told and in ways that they didn't think their stories were going to be told. And the best example I can think of this right now is like, um, it's really, really easy for me as a filmmaker to film something from a given perspective and decide all those perspectives, mm -hmm. right? And decide all those lenses and decide the camera, decide the film back and do all that work and then color it the way I want. It's a totally different story to go, here's a volumetric video. You, user at home, are to explore this either a video game device or on your TV sure. through your remote control or through a headset. And how are we going to solve the question of what happens when the user is able to use any lens, any camera, any angle and experience? The well, I mean, this is something that goes on in video games, right? And I always, yeah, exactly. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a jerk, but when, it, when I play video games and you have a person that's telling me this very serious narrative, I, I jump around them like because I'm an idiot yeah. and I'm just like, I don't, I know this isn't real and I'm doing, you know, yeah. but if I've, you know, imagine if this was, you know, shot by Tarantino, it's like, you can't just jump around yeah. while someone is revealing their, you know, like it's just, it's does it. So having the choice to do those things are, are, are definitely a choice. Uh, yeah. uh, but I think it's, it's interesting. I still believe that there's going to be traditional shot films, 2D films that people are going to watch passively third person, right? I think it goes nowhere. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I don't think filmmaking is going anywhere. So I, I'm a firm believer that what people really want is choice. You know, I, I did a talk recently, and one of the things that we talked about was um, uh, choose your own adventure books. Oh, so yeah, the yeah. example I give, right, everyone's read a choose your own adventure book, right? But not everyone always chooses to read a choose your own adventure sure. book, right? Some people don't have that. They don't, they don't want it at the end of a long work week to sit down think about a narrative and type a prompt in and have it generated AI and then be able to navigate it freely. They want someone who is a master at telling a story and visualizing that story to think of a really complex environment. They want the, they want a star Wars. They want a game of Thrones. They want the, or make, the make choices right? that they wouldn't want to make. Right. 
Yeah, exactly. That are really difficult choices in some cases. Right? Who like who is going to sit at home? Someone who hasn't told the story before and choose to kill off the main character, right? For a lot of people, that's a really difficult thing to do. But for a filmmaker who has a story they want to tell, like that might be an important thing sure. to do. Um, I don't think traditional filmmaking is going anywhere. And in fact, what I see is more opportunities to bridge the gap between traditional filmmaking and users at home. So opportunities to extend traditional filmmaking into gaming and gaming into traditional filmmaking um, and more opportunities to immerse our audiences into into these environments um, that they want to be immersed in in a way that is almost tangible. Right. And I think to me that so starting a new business and the business is entirely around empowering the next generation of storytellers. Right. right? How do we help the people who are in telling great stories right now in Fortnite using real-time tools. How do we help them transition to telling really great stories as a traditional film medium, but with real-time tools, sure. right? Um, and then when there's so many more consumers on the planet, so many more people who are involved in cons- you know, viewing this content, how do, we, how do we meet that demand, right? How do we build tools that enable 10 artists to do the work of, of 100 and 100 artists to do the work of 1,000, right? And that's what that's what we're focused on right now. So this sort of puts in the thing that the LED wall itself is not nece- is only a small portion of what you're looking at, right? So you're looking more at the entire experience. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, look, do I think LED walls are going anywhere? Uh, not in the short term. In the long term, I think we end up in a, you know, in a world where we don't need the LED in some fashion because we are on set, hopefully able to go, hey, I, I want to remove that background element and the background element gets removed and it gets recorded right. into a separate track on the mag. And, you know, real, real time compositing. <laughs> yeah, real time compositing. Right. Like, and it's a holy yep. grail. Right. Um, but it's something that I'm like extremely, extremely interested in. Um, and I think that to me is is one step in 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 many in getting to a future where storytelling is do, Storytellers are doing the thing they do best, which is tell stories together, mm. right? Like for so long, we, we've pushed storytelling into post. And I think if we can bring more post into production and more pre into production, mm. we can stand there and go, I don't like the way that house looks like. Let's give it an extra chimney. Let's change it to brick instead of white paint. And, and um, we have meaningful decisions to make and, and can enable those decisions to be affected on set. I think we are helping people tell stories um, in, a, in a more real and genuine way that I think enable us to a be more quick and be more efficient, um, produce more content. Um, but also I think tell stories that maybe haven't been told before because they've been locked behind the complexities of budgets. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, this is something that can be made accessible to independent filmmakers. So it's so much easier for them to tell the story they want to tell versus, Oh, we've got to do $50 million a post. Right. Sure. Um, so that's one of the things that I, one of the things that we're, that, I'm, that we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I do want to skip forward to, you know, obviously you we you were one of the lucky people, shall we say, I'm just going to say that as a to to see a little bit about what Project Arena was and and to be able to see it on set. We're not necessarily going to talk because you you did see it when we we didn't mention we're doing a short, so people can know about that. We're not going to talk about a short, no spoilers. But uh yeah. but I do want to have uh, some thoughts on, you know, obviously you understand a little bit about the project. You understand what we're trying to accomplish. And I'm just yep. curious about your thoughts on how that does and how that fits into the landscape of virtual production. Yeah. So um, for me, I think uh, Arena offers a I, – I think it speaks very much to the thing that I believe in, which is how do we very quickly and seamlessly move into – without lots of translation layers into – telling stories. And to me, that's what it represents. It represents the ability to very quickly build environments in a way that we're already comfortable doing mm-hmm. and very easily move them into seeing them in real time in a photo reel uh, caliber um, in, in a way that I think is um, faster than what is currently available. And production is all about speed and all about making those changes and all about being able to actually do it uh, together and, and to not have to take these you know, oh, we need multiple pipelines or we're deviating here or we need a different set of artists or we need um, a completely different skill set because um, there's a different type of tech that needs to get built over here. Right. I think to me, that's what it represents. It represents um, one of, I think, uh, uh, many, uh, uh, not one of many, but one of a handful of options around solving this problem of, of bifurcated pipelines that uh, the game engines have created. And I think um People will still use game engines and people will hopefully lean into using Arena, right? Because I think it's a great solution for um, 
really quickly getting something that looks really good up on uh, any number of virtual production solutions. Yeah. What, what were some of the, I mean, b- besides the, uh, the the ease of getting the stuff, did you see any th- other sort of quality issues of, of what was going on there in terms of your experience? I mean, you've been on a lot of stages. <laughs> been on a lot of stages. No, I'm, uh, I mean, the sheer detail, right? Like I think something that, that can't be re- currently replicated in a meaningful way in real time is still the sheer amount of detail that is represented in a high quality visual effects asset. And while we're getting closer, mm-hmm. right? Like I think arena offers something that, you know, just the number of the, the, you know, the, the, the detail in the meshes, the detail in the textures, right. And the, uh, something that is not faked, right. You know, I think we talk a lot about like game engines and like, are they fake so much, right. There's always a cheat to make the real time work. And this is not that right. it's the real deal. Right. Like, and at some point we're also used to working with the real deal. Right. right? And I think, it makes it so much easier to work with, but it, it looks great. Right. Because yep. it is, the, it's as close to the real deal as it can be. Yeah. I mean, obviously there are a lot of things, right? There are still a lot of things that are going on in game engines. Like you said, we're not necessarily trying to replace it with arena, but there are things like, you know, simulations and character motion capture and stuff, yep. but that's not built into arena, at, at least not at this time, because we're still sort of exploring that space. But, uh, but I think it's, you know, there are still a huge amount of people that want just a really beautiful environment <laughs> yeah. and I want it there fast. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think this gives, I, what I think arena gives people that is not necessarily discovered yet is the ability to decide, like be going through visual effects work in pre and decide on a Tuesday that they want to do something on a Thursday, right? Where right now, if you decide on Tuesday, you want to do something in a volume, it's going to be weeks, right? In many right. cases. Um, and I think it's the, Oh, hey, this would work really well in an LED volume. Will work really well in green. And like, okay, well, we can solve that problem in two days instead of in two weeks or two months, right? right. And um, productions are always just looking for flexibility, right? And um, you know, it, it'll be the right fit for some people, and uh, people will continue to use other things. But I think this should just be another tool in our bag, right? And you know, it, to me, it's a tool that allows me to on Monday go, yeah, we're going to do that this week. We're not waiting another <laughs> three weeks for it to be right, ready. Right, right. That's I awesome. mean, I think part of the thing that, you know, I mean, I may be wrong, but like there's a lot of people that were sort of hesitant to adapt to real-time game engines because of the amount of training and the time and the yeah. cost and everything. And so this sort of opens up the door to a lot more virtual production or, yeah. or people to be, be open to more uh, going into that space. Exactly, right? It opens up to the pool, the pool of artists, right. right? And I think that's super important, right? Like one of the, the, the biggest hurdles of adoption is how do you get artists into an Unreal or Unity-like workflow, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I think in this case, right, it's not, you don't have to do that. There's so many visual effects artists already out there. And in many cases, there's so many game artists who were already working in something like Maya, right? right? Or, or do, you know, we're doing concept work that was rendered in V, right? right? And, and I think that's like a really like important point is that it's, it's a bunch of people who already know the tool, right? And it removes that barrier of entry that I think is, in some cases, really, really difficult to move past. Sure, 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 sure. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about you know. Obviously, you 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 were able to see that was great. But what what are your thoughts about the future of of filmmaking in, in that process, and how does real time sort of affect it beyond beyond what you were talking about? I know that there's still the, the conversations of we're going to go to it, adapt to to multimedia experiences. But what do you what are your some of your other thoughts about like how storytelling will evolve through this itself? Yeah, I I am. Um I really believe that filmmakers, like t- fast forward 10 years, will have high quality LED off camera that's providing digital lighting and some reference points for actors. Sure. And then everything else will be done, you know, in in camera, in a in a in camera and in mag in a way that just like isn't done right now. It'll be, hey, I really need a flame sim in the background and a real time uh, flame simulator will whip up flames and you'll be seeing it, mm-hmm. right? And uh You'll use uh, depth uh, or markerless motion tracking to uh, roto out the person in front in real time and put the flames behind them. And at some point, you'll be able to get actually uh, the information of what's going on when they move, right? And actually uh, have them uh, sort of uh, change those particles, change that part, that that simulation. Um, To me, that's the 10 years. Um, And I think for me, it means the LED isn't really going anywhere. It's just got to get better so it can do better skin lighting, right? We're already seeing a lot Mm -hmm. of that. Um, there's gotta be a lot of cameras that comes from the panels. (laughs) 
Yeah, come from the panels. Yeah. yeah, right. And 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 I, I one of the things that I think is really impressive for me to witness over the last five years is the number of large manufacturers that are starting to really pay attention to the space, right? Like for so long, LED was a thing that you bought to put on your building in downtown, right? Like it was like, and, and we don't think about it, I think as filmmakers, but like we are such a small, although we are noisy, we are a very small business, right? right? Um, like there is more LED sold to a, a building than is used on most of the sets in LA combined, right? right? Um, you know, uh, uh, if you look at Shanghai, the number of there's millions of LED tiles that are covering, you know, building facades, right? You look at, at Times Square, same thing, right? Um, but the fact that we've gained the attention and that attention is what I think as visual effects people were really good at always is the noise is always about quality, right? It's how do we get to a higher quality? How do we make things look better? Um, and I think that's where also storytelling evolves to, right? Like mm-hmm. it, it will be how do we tell better how do we tell better stories that look better, right? And uh, how do we do it faster? Um, and for me, it's going to be um, it's going to be doing things together in situ. I mean, I think we're seeing, and, and I do believe game engines will play a part of this certainly. But like, I think we're seeing more uh, individual previs artists who are leveraging things like Lumen and Nanite to create really good real time simulations of tech viz and camera simulation work. Mm-hmm. Um, we certainly saw that with Dune with Greg Frazier, um, and I think we'll see a lot more of that. Um, and I think eventually the coalescence of all these things, hopefully, which is a beautiful real time rendering that is is physically accurate and real time path tracing, hopefully at some point. Um, and um, we're seeing it now, like we look at the DLSS stuff that's come out in the last just year or two. And it's I mean, it's amazing. Like it's it is probably one of the largest technological improvements that people don't realize that they have that's, access. That's to. the crux of Vantage right now <laughs> of Arena. Yeah. It, it is it is it has enabled people to work at resolutions and and at time scales that they would never have been able to yep. do even two or three years ago and i don't know that everyone has grappled with that concept sure. yet right and yes it's, it's machine learning right and i think i want to make a clear distinction between ai and machine learning like i, I believe we are very far off from synthetic humans i believe we are not that far off from from filmmaking centric machine learning tools sure. right and that's what we, we should be building for and i think that's what storytellers want is they want tools that understand the thing that they're trying to achieve right um and so when i think about the future of storytelling it's it's easier it's easier to to get to higher quality yeah um and and to do so faster to reduce the iteration cycle time right and that to me is 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 everything yeah well i want to sort of end with a little bit about the filmmaker experience because i think this is something that you witnessed firsthand in many many ways and i think it was something really cool that i was seeing obviously with what we were shooting uh last week and it's around the idea of um you know the filmmakers for so long were just shooting a blue screen and hoping for the best right and it was so such a, a, a bad experience and then obviously virtual production came along and has like sort of helped that but it became super super technical uh and having someone like like Richard Crudo who's a very 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 talented uh, you know a cinematographer uh telling him what he need what he can do inside of an arena and suddenly he's like oh i have control over the cg something i never had control over yeah. what do you what do you think of that experience when you see filmmakers realize that they actually it's their choices yeah. about what's going on in cg so it's really i i have i have a bunch of a bunch of anecdotes but i have i have two minds of thoughts so i'll tell you my my first my my anecdote that's always is is the one that'll stick with me the rest of my life is when we did solo we recreated the castle run which yes. is you know if you know star wars and this famous moment with the money and falcon and um you know we hooked up the the handles of the money and falcon to, to sort of trigger the uh the hyperspace moment right. right and um i think it was the first time a bunch of leadership from lucasfilm flew in from wherever they were and they came to london and they went in the cockpit of Millennium falcon and they said okay we're gonna go do the thing and like got to push the button that send a bunch of people into hyperspace i think for the first time and like for the first time there was like this audible gasp and you realize that 
uh, they believe they're there, right? Like the, the, the flip, the switch is flipped, right? They're there. And it's something that is in, in a way tangible. It's the most intangible thing that has become almost as real as it ever possibly could. Right. And it's happening here and it's happening now. And it's something that we can manipulate. Right. And I think it's that last part that's so important, right? It's the manipulation of it. And so I, I have these two minds. One mind is, um, for DPs to be able to come in and actually touch the thing that's in camera means that everything is a location now. Places that were never locations before, the, the the surface of Mars is now a location they can go to and they can go, I don't like the way that crater looks. I don't like the way the rover is moving. I don't like the way the sandstorm is going across the planet. And they can make those decisions about locations that none of us could ever have imagined. Sure. And on the second side of me is... What a political nightmare this has opened up for all of us, right? Um, and we've been battling this for years, um, certainly at Lux and at my new venture. Like we, we battle this, which is this idea of how do you who, – who has the control, right? A bunch of visual effects artists working with a visual effects supervisor have created something that like they're so used – they in their own mind, they're so used to – Oh, after the show, I get to tweak the way it looks and I get to integrate it and it looks right and I get to have a creative impact on it. But now we're standing together and a director and a DP are going to have an opinion on what that thing is. Right. And I can't really change it later on, right? Um, in the same way. And it, it opens up a new conversation about, in many ways, like how do we get back to where we started, which is making decisions together in a room collaboratively. And I think ultimately that's what we should be solving yeah. for. Uh, so those are my two, two mindsets about it. It's both the best that we could help for storytellers. And in many cases, it is a opportunity and a challenge to go back to how do we navigate right. the politics of on set, something that we haven't had to do for 20 or 30 yeah, years. Yeah, I mean, it's very clear when you're on set, a traditional physical, you know, like that decision is being made by makeup, that decision is being made by art department, yeah. that's prop department, you know, all, all, all these different things. And now suddenly like, oh, wait, who's deciding whether the rover moves? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and it and it's something that we'll have to we'll have to come to understand, right? And we'll have to work together to figure yeah. out. And to me, that's the that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, listen, uh, Phil, I'm sure we will be talking again. This I think this is an uh, evolving space. You guys are obviously up to some great new adventures. I can't wait to hear more about uh, your new adventures when they come along. So definitely give us a heads up if there's some project that you want to talk about. Love to have you back Ooh. on. Uh, but this education process of what we're doing and having, you know, uh, a third person experience of arena, although we can't talk about the project itself, but a third person experience uh, and being able to narrate that is really, really helpful. So thanks so much for doing this, Phil. Of course. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And uh, look forward to talking again soon.